So before we do any presentation at Royal Roads, we always acknowledge that we live, learn, and work on the traditional lands of the Kosepsim and the Kwangan ancestors and families. Learning has been happening here for countless generations, and we are so grateful to be on this land. Um, I also want to take a moment to acknowledge that we are in month seven of a very complex time. And of course, there's been so many uh, social and inequity issues that have arisen through this time. And um, you know, we, we recognize that people are really looking for a way forward. Um, how do we navigate um, all these new challenges that have come up and how do we creatively make a new future that's going to be better than the one that we were living before? And that's what Royal Roads is about. It's about exploring these issues and, and finding new ways of addressing them. And of course, that's what this new specialization is about. And we're really going to dig into that disaster and emergency management in the context of tourism. Maybe wasn't something that was so popular uh, a few uh, months ago, but Jen, who we will be talking to in a little bit, who has that background, has really, really demonstrated how important it now is. And I'm sure everyone in the industry knows that. So of course, we're here to explore the Master of Arts in Tourism Management and this new specialization that we're offering in disaster and emergency management. Uh, I'm Alana McConaughey, I'm an education advisor. Um, I'll mostly be on the back end of the webinar, but I will be, I will be around. Um, looking for questions and, and helping people out. But uh, our hosts today are Dr. Eugene Tomlinson, who's an associate professor and the director of the School of Tourism and Hospitality Management. So welcome, Eugene. And we are so lucky to have Jen Hutby Ferguson back again. Uh, she is one of our Master of Arts and Tourism Management graduates and a current doctoral student at Royal Roads. And she has uh, extensive background working in disaster and emergency management within the tourism context. So that is just something that uh, she's the right gal with the right information these days and um, she's going to be digging into why this is so important. So thank you so much Jen for, for being here with us today. My pleasure. I'm glad to be here. <laughs> My favorite topic. <laughs> I know, I love it. Um, and then we also have a few people that uh, probably won't be talking much, but you'll see them in the chat box. So we have uh, Tracy Summers, who is an enrollment advisor. So she'll be in the chat box answering questions. She is domestic enrollment. And we also have our international enrollment advi advisor, now Fujiwara, who will also be answering questions that are more geared towards international students. So do keep an eye out for both of them. Oh, and I should also mention I have my colleague Christy in the uh, here as well in case anything comes up technology wise. So she will also potentially be answering questions and uh, she might pop on as well. So um, now that you know who we are, we'd love to get a sense of who's in the room with us. So if you feel comfortable just typing in where you're watching in from, maybe what kind of work you're up to, anything that you want to share with us, it's a good opportunity to test out the chat box. We'd love to hear from you. And as you type, I'll let you know what we're going to be up to. So we're going to go through a really, really brief overview of the Royal Roads experience. As I mentioned in the invite, we're not going to do an in-depth dive into the Master of Tourism Management. Um, can I just make sure that everyone's muted? Can everybody check and make sure they're muted for me? Thank you. Um, and um, we, so for this webinar, we are going to look at kind of how the specialization works within the MATM, uh, but we are going to um, mostly be diving into the disaster emergency management. So if you are looking for in-depth uh, information on this program, I will be sending out a webinar recording for the last webinar that we did. So you can, you can check that out later. So just be aware of that. Um, so Eugene is going to talk about how the specializations work within the program. And then we're going to hear from both Jen and Eugene about the value of emergency management for tourism professionals. So that's going to be a really interesting conversation. Um, we're going to do questions after that point. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, please let your questions flow as they arise, but know that we're have a discussion period after Jen's presentation uh, and we will wrap up with the application process and requirements. So I just want to get a sense of who's in the up. Can I ask uh, Jen to look in the chat box and see who's here? Maybe let us know who's, uh, who's come in. Did you say Jen? <laughs> yeah, that's sure. <laughs> okay, great. Sure. Um, I was just making sure that that's what I heard. Oh my goodness. Um, Christine is, of course, joining from Victoria, our colleague here at Royal Roads. Um, Terry Dusenberry is with is from joining us from Delta, and he's a consultant in uh, the tourism and hospitality industry. And Joel says he's now from Kelowna, um, also in hotel management. 
Fabian is in Kenya. So welcome, whatever time it is for you um, today, Fabian. And um, Tara Stenberg, who is um, a former VIU grad. Uh, so that's close to my heart. I'm also an instructor at Vancouver Island University and now working in local government um, in North Cowichan and Perspective Services. So um, awesome. Those are the Thank folks you. who said hello. Thank you so much. I don't know what's going on with my chat box, so I really appreciate you uh, you reading out and welcome to everyone who's here and shared where they're watching in from. So as I said, we're not going to go too deep into the Royal Road specific information, but I just wanted to give you a bit of a, a highlight of where we're at and, and where we're situated. So we are in Victoria, BC, which is on Vancouver Island. Uh, Victoria, BC is the capital of British Columbia within Canada, and we are actually not only a public university, we are also a national historic site, which makes us a wonderful place to be studying to tourism. So a little bit of history about the castle. It was built in the early 1900s. Uh, the Dunsmuirs were the ones who built it. They only lived there for a couple decades and then the federal government took over the land and it became a military college for 55 years. And then in 1995, Royal Roads came into being. And when Royal Roads came into being, it was really about offering a different kind of education. Uh, it had a government mandate to offer programs for professionals who were wanting applied skills that they could take into their career right away and potentially keep working as, as they move through the program. So we We've expanded from there. We do have many on-campus programs that people do full-time at this point, but that was the original intention and that's uh, actually been kind of really part of the fabric of all of our programs is making sure people have that applied experience and can have impact with their programs. And uh, we have many beautiful campuses. Uh, the Sherman Gen building is our newest building and um, this building is actually where the School of Tourism and Hospitality is. It is the um, a really wonderful representative of what Royal Roads is all about because it is a combination of new and old. It was the stables when it was uh, the castle was around and it's being turned into this very modern looking building. So really taking an old structure and creating something very new and innovative, which I think is a beautiful metaphor for, for Royal Roads in general. And then Esquimalt Lagoon, which is actually the view from the back of the castle. It's a bird sanctuary as well. And just past the lagoon is the ocean, uh, which, you know, just everywhere you look, there's something beautiful to see. And we also have been delivering online learning for 25 years, which obviously in this point of time is something we're incredibly proud of. Um, you know, many universities we know have really had to pivot quite dramatically to, to do this kind of delivery. And at Royal Roads, um, there has been a pivot involved. Our, our on-campus residencies have been turned into uh, online intensives, but we've been able to do that really quite skillfully. So uh, definitely a, a great choice for education in these times where we are mostly living online. And with that, I also wanted to mention that we're an Ashoka Changemaker campus. So what this means, you know, I made mention that Royal Roads is an applied university. It's about making change. But this is a designation that we have that means that we are committed to bringing our learning outside of the classroom. So anytime a student has an opportunity to, to make change with uh, their projects, um, we really support that. And I think at the MATM, there's so many cool examples of that. Just to speak to a few, um, we have uh, Kathy McRae, who graduated, I believe, in 2000. 2018 um, and she did her final project on looking at the grizzly bear uh, viewing versus the grizzly bear hunt and she actually was able to change her final project into new legislation and um, and she's now the president of the grizzly bear view or the bear viewing association as well um, and we also have Jason Alsap who uh, worked with Parks Canada to help um, the Haida Nation Takeover Stewardship Authority of the Guayanas Park up in Haida Gwaii. And um, yeah, again, just made some really significant impact. And I, I believe he's, he's the president of Haida Nation now. So, you know, people have really gone on to do some really interesting things with this degree. It's a very unique degree to begin with. So these specializations just enhance that to the next level. And from there, I'm going to let Eugene take over. Great. Thank you very much. If we go on to the, the next slide. So right now we've got three different uh, options for you when you're going into the program. We've got the on campus, which is was typically where we, uh, we would be seeing most of the students. And of course, we've had to pivot and go online with that but uh, we're hoping to be moving back onto campus. There's always going to be some online options with the on-campus though, as much to give people greater options, such as 
uh, these specializations as anything. Um, and also open up opportunities for, you know, a much broader understanding of everything. There's a, a blended version where you would generally do most of your program online, but we have these residencies like Alana was mentioning, um, where you would come back onto campus and spend a week or approximately 10 days with an intensive going through a course. But it also gives you an opportunity to get to know the campus a bit more, um, your fellow students, everything like that. And with these blended programs, we have students from all across Canada and occasionally internationally that are joining us there. And the graduate certificate, which for some people, it's a way of um, adding some skills or adding some additional things, education to your, your degree or to your background. Um, but for others, it's actually kind of a, a nice way of dipping your toe in the water, of seeing what it's like to do, to come back to school, to look into the Master's in Tourism Management program. And that graduate certificate can be laddered into either one of the other uh, complete degree programs. So just really trying to be flexible with how we allow student or get students into the program. Not wanting to, I don't want to, you know, spend too much time on all of the courses that are there, but just to let you know, you can see on the screen, some of the core courses that all the students would be taking. And then we've got a host of other electives. So really what we're trying to do is give you a good foundation in tourism and hospitality. Uh, everything from the, you know, those sort of hard skills of things like marketing and finance and, and leadership. Um, but then some of the softer skills of collaborating because you'll be working with students from um, around the world. We have very much an international student body. So you get to learn and with a lot of our uh, courses heavily looking at tour of uh, working in team projects, it gives you an opportunity to work and collaborate and really get to know people uh, and different perspectives and different views on the various issues that are occurring in tourism and hospitality. When you get into the program, and this is for both the, the blended and the, uh, the on-campus, you've got three different options for completing the, the program. Uh, first, there is a thesis, which is your, your typical thesis where you're doing, uh, focused on a research project. It's worth 12 credits towards your final, and it gives you an opportunity to really dig deep into a problem or an issue or an opportunity that you're interested in, in tourism and hospitality. And one big difference between it and the next option, the major research project is, while both of them focus on conducting primary research in tourism and hospitality, um, the thesis has an external component to it where it's being validated through um, an external panel that does look at the thesis and assesses it, um, the, the materials that are in it. So that's, those are your two main projects. The capstone course, for those that want to more focused on coursework instead of their own primary research project, you've got the capstone course, which is more of a course-based option and you take more courses, but you do not do that sort of primary research that is in the thesis or the major research project. Which kind of leads us to the specializations. And we recognized within the program that for some students, um, they like that sort of broad understanding of everything that's going on in tourism and hospitality management. Um, but others prefer to dig a little bit deeper on a particular topic that's of interest. And 
with these specializations that have been introduced or that we're introducing, you focus your major research project or your thesis and take two courses from one of the other schools and you really focus in all of your attention on these specializations that, uh, that give you, you know, just that much more understanding of how it, uh, that different specialization works how it applies to tourism and hospitality and makes you even more of an expert in that area. Um, in some respects, very much like Jen is in her field of disaster and emergency management. And that does show up on your, your transcript. So, Right now, um, in January of 2021, so in just a few short months, um, whenever we can kind of get through this 2020, um, we've got two new specializations that we will be introducing at that time. I, a couple of weeks ago, we talked about the social entrepreneurship specialization and um, all of the elements and what that entailed. And today we're wanting to focus on the disaster and emergency management with Jen and how disaster and emergency management really uh, connects up with tourism and hospitality management. In the future, uh, we've got a few other specializations that we will be introducing, things like human security, the higher education, learning and technology, and a social entrepreneurship. Or, yeah. Um, sustainability will also be introduced. We're hoping to do sustainability by September of 2021. And so this leads us into the, our new specialization in disaster and emergency management uh, uh -huh. with our disaster and emergency management specialist expert. Um, <laughs> And not only expert, but she works in this in her field as well. Um, so very much has that sort of practical and the theoretical uh, expertise in the area. So over to you, Jen. Thanks. Thanks, Eugene. Hi, everybody. Good morning. This is my most favorite topic. So I'm going to give uh, a little bit of an overview here in terms of why I think disaster emergency management is so relevant to the tourism industry. I mean, I think if 2020 has taught us anything, it is that we need to be prepared for everything. Um, and I have long been an advocate of being prepared, not scared. I think that's my, my tagline. And some of my tourism colleagues call me Madam Disaster. So not because I am a disaster, but because I, I, I believe that we need to be ready for them. So let me just qualify that. Um, Atlanta, I'll ask you to flip. There we go. So why does disaster and emergency management matter to the tourism industry? And certainly we're in a global pandemic. Uh, many of us that work in disaster and emergency management, you know, are we prepared for this? Did, did we think that, that a pandemic could happen? Of course. You know, we saw H1N1. I also had the, uh, the opportunity to um, work. I was working in Ontario during SARS, um, first with 9-11 and then very shortly after by SARS. And, you know, when you start to realize that certainly these things can happen here, we've seen other incidents, you know, Ebola in, in parts of Africa, we've seen, um, you know, Middle East uh, respiratory syndrome that was centered in, in the Middle East. And so, you know, there are pockets of the world that have experienced these types of situations before, but never at this sort of global scale since the Spanish flu in 1918. Um, and the reality is that disasters and emergencies are increasing in frequency and severity. So we're seeing more severe hurricane seasons. We're seeing extensive wildfire seasons. California has now had its third record setting wildfire season for the third year in a row. Um, hundreds of thousands of people displaced, significant economic um, disruption. We're seeing similar situations in, in hurricanes where this year the projection by NOAA, so the uh, Oceanic uh, Atmospheric Association in the United States projected that we would see 25 hurricanes. That is a very significant hurricane season. And this year, Hurricane Zeta, which hit uh, Louisiana and the Gulf Coast last night, was the 25th storm of the season. We still have 30 days to go in hurricane season and what would traditionally be called hurricane season. So 
the impacts to those regions, and we're also seeing continued and sustained impacts, um, whereby we're seeing the compounding effects of those types of situations. So not only are we dealing with, let's say, wildfires that are happening, then we also have a hurricane. In addition to that, we're dealing with a global pandemic. Um, we're seeing flooding, landslides. So there are things that happen on top of what would traditionally be um, what would traditionally be a you know kind of a one disaster sort of situation, and it's changing the way that we do things. Um, COVID-19, of course, has also impacted the way that we respond to disasters. We really have to think about what do mass evacuations look like? Normally, we would look to our hotel partners or we would look to municipal infrastructure to, to facilitate large-scale evacuations. Now we have to rethink, do we need more than one facility? How, do we, how can we keep people physically distant? What does that look like? How can we safely feed people and ensure that we're not um, you know, a, a further spreading transmit disease? Um, and from the tourism industry perspective, we're seeing those coastal communities. So when I think of coastal, I think certainly of British Columbia and all the way down the, the coast of, of uh, California, Oregon, uh, Washington State, and then obviously on the eastern seaboard as well. And Florida, Texas, um, Louisiana, the Gulf Coast, they've been inundated with storm after storm after storm this season. And so, you know, that impacts how visitors make decisions to travel to those regions, even in the midst of a pandemic. It changes, you know, how we interact among ourselves and how we perceive long term those destinations as a as a place we might like to go to. So, um, you know, there's 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 still lots happening, and uh, and those small island states are are often seeing tourism as a major economic generator. So that's another consideration. So as we know, severe weather is increasing. We're seeing those storms. The other consideration here is that um, we are seeing small island states. So when I think of our friends in the Caribbean, so we had a, I have someone joining us today from Jamaica. Those are states that really are reliant on tourism as, as a primary economic generator. So that's a significant consideration. How do we mitigate the risk to individuals who or, or people who are traveling to those regions? Um, where can they go to be safe? Very often they are also low lying. We're seeing that in other parts of the world in the South Pacific where rising sea levels are impacting um, people's ability to move. We saw last year Venice, um, piazzas in Venice and, and other parts of Italy were underwater. So again, that's impacting people's ability to, to travel and to generate a um, economic uh, opportunity. Of course, there are economic impacts. We've all heard this, right? <laughs> that we're all feeling it, I think, too. If we work in tourism, I mean, our friends in the hospitality industry have been, have been severely impacted in attractions as well. And, and the cruise industry and the airline industry are among those that have been the hardest hit. The cruise industry is, is projected to start in the United States again at this point. They're saying um, December-ish. That has been pushed back several times, and I expect will be pushed back again. Right now, Florida has, uh, uh, is not allowing cruise ships to um, uh, embark or disembark in, in their region. And obviously that's a significant hub for cruise traffic. And that impacts other economies as well. As I mentioned, some of our friends in um, the Caribbean, cruise ships are the mainstay or cruise, cruise ship travelers are the mainstay of, of their uh, economy. So there are the people who come and spend in their restaurants. There are the people who go on, on trips and, and do day trips throughout the region. And they're spending when they're there. We also know that international visitors spend more and tend to stay longer. So you may have some individuals, for example, who may disembark from Puerto Rico and may go and spend two or three days in advance of departure and then do a seven or 14 day cruise, um, getting off perhaps on another island and again, spending some time in that region. So with, with that completely gone, those small island states are being significantly impacted. In addition to that, we are also seeing impacts to business continuity. And I think that this is a really important piece. Some of us think, okay, so I'm, I'm ready. You know, I have a plan. We have, you know, we've identified what hazards exist in our region. So in British Columbia, we think often about earthquakes and tsunamis. I've got a plan for that. I know where high ground is. I know I can safely evacuate my hotel. Um, we saw that during the wildfire season where, you know, it, some hotels or some regions had to be evacuated. But my question is, what do you do when the visitors can't get to you? So it's all well and good to have a plan for what happens when something happens on your property or on your tour or in your community. 
But what happens if people can't get to you? And we first started to experience this in British Columbia during the 2017 wildfires. And that was where we saw whole communities evacuated and therefore highways were open in some areas, but people were not permitted to be traveling to communities. They couldn't stop in communities. And therefore the, the impact there was devastating. We're seeing supply chain impacts whereby products that traditionally would be available. I'll give you an example, lump charcoal for barbecue um, is one of those funny things that is almost impossible to get right now. Um, we're seeing uh, even, you know, we say shop local and you want to encourage people to shop in your community and spend in your community. And, and you know, in the cruise ship ports, I think of Vancouver and Victoria and our friends in Halifax, people walk along the boardwalk and they visit those little shops. Many of them are those homegrown shops that, you know, make homemade soap or bath salts or, um, you know, maybe local food products. And now we're seeing where you can't get jars or can't get lids or can't get the packaging that, that they would typically put those products in. So it's all well and good to say buy local, but we're still seeing supply chain impacts and that more broadly impacts the tourism industry. So these are the things we need to be, we need to be considering. I'm going to pause there. <laughs> one of the you're other... Also mentioning, yeah, Jen, you're, you, you're also mentioning to me at one point about the impact on insurance. Yes. So one of the things that I think most people don't, don't realize is when you have, when you are in a situation where there is, let's say I'm going to use wildfire as an example. We saw this in 2017 and 2018. If you are selling a home or a business or trying to renew your insurance, because of course we all know insurance is renewed on an annual basis. Um, if there has been a wildfire in your region or an emergency declaration and or evacuations in your region, your insurance will go up. And we saw in, the, in Northern BC in 2018, so following the 2017 season, before the 2018 wildfire season was even underway, we saw um, increases of 300% in insurance in some cases, making it cost prohibitive for people to obtain it if they could even find a company that was willing to cover them. So that is a massive consideration. When you think about you have a hotel, of course you want to protect that asset, but if insurance becomes cost prohibitive, how do you, how do you, how do you balance that? Um, so extremely challenging. And if you're in a situation where you're trying to sell a business and it happens to be located with assets in a wildfire zone and you're under evacuation alert, even alert, not even an order, but an alert, um, it will, you will be unable to obtain insurance. The new buyer will be unable to obtain insurance and therefore it will impact the, your ability for, for the sale to close. That's both on a, on a traditional home as well as on a business. So that's a really significant, really significant issue. Thanks. Uh, good question, Eugene. <laughs> uh, one of the other things that I think is really important and one of the skills that I, that I think the MATM program really helps us to consider on many different levels from a sustainability perspective, um, from, an, you know, from an ethical uh, tourism perspective, is that resident versus visitor sort of push and pull. And I think as a destination marketer, and that's the world I lived in along with hotels for many, many years, it, it is a real balancing act. As a DMO, you're, you're driven to generate that economic opportunity for your community. That's your goal, is to help your, the businesses in your community succeed and to, and to be recognized and to sort of put the destination on the map. But on the flip side, we also have to consider how do the residents feel about that? Are we seeing you know, over-tourism in, in some locations? And we've heard about some of that in some communities here in BC. We've absolutely seen it overseas. And I'm thinking of Spain, for example, or in Venice, whereby you know, there's more tourists than residents and, and the cost of living is so high, it's very difficult to keep people um, in the shops and in the restaurants and in the hotels to service those visitors. So, so that becomes a really challenging piece. When we think about COVID and the situation that we're in right now, this is really becoming um, a significant opportunity and challenge. I, I see it both ways in terms of some communities have made the decision that they'd prefer visitors not come at this time. And that is to protect the folks that are in their community. In some cases, those are Indigenous communities, but in lots of cases, it is not Indigenous communities. But they may be more remote and therefore access to healthcare infrastructure is maybe not what it would be in a major center. And therefore, they're looking to protect their community. So as destination marketers or as tourism operators, we have to consider that. We also have to think about what role do we play in terms of communicating how we're helping people be safe. 
How do we help people understand when they come to Tofino or Euclid or an area that's at seismic risk? How do we tell them this is how you get to high ground? If the ground shakes, this is what you need to do. That has to be part of the conversation that's happening. And I can tell you in Tofino it is part of the conversation. When people check into a hotel, it's part of the conversation. And we're normalizing the hazard that exists in that region. And I think as, as tourism professionals, that's such a great opportunity. You know, it's not about being fearful, own, own where you are, but help the visitor make a good choice and to understand what hazards are in that region. By nature, visitors don't see the geographic boundary. They don't know when they go from, you know, in Victoria, thinking about Victoria, British Columbia, we have 13 municipalities that make up Greater Victoria. A visitor doesn't know if they're in Colwood or Esquimalt or actually in the city of Victoria. They don't know that. They just know that they're in Victoria. And so they're looking to a DMO to help them understand what, where the risks are. And they may not know what the hazards are in that region. Very likely they don't know where to go if there was an emergency. So these are the things we need to be thinking about. Um, one of the other pieces here, I think we're gonna go to the bubble slide next, I think is the bubble slide. Um, one of the things that we are seeing, and we've seen this this summer with COVID is, is bubble tourism. And we've seen this in the past with some other jurisdictions when we saw, for example, the earthquakes in Christchurch, we saw Australia was the first sort of to come to, to sort of come back, if you will, to New Zealand. Um, in Atlantic Canada, we've seen the Atlantic Canada bubble, whereby people have the freedom to, to travel within, within Atlantic Canada, but individuals coming or traveling from outside of Atlantic Canada must quarantine for 14 days. And so I think that's, that's been interesting. In British Columbia, we're bubbled with the Yukon. So Yukoners can come to um, can come to British Columbia and can and can uh, and can sort of freely travel within within the province. We're e I'm even starting to see when we look at international travel. So again, targeting that Atlantic Canada market that's been pretty safe, relatively low case numbers, and we're seeing uh, hotels in Cuba or in Dominican Republic, whereby they're actually taking a wing and putting all of the people from Atlantic Canada in that wing so that they can sort of maintain their bubble. I don't know how that works in terms of, they're still going out to restaurants and such, but the reality is that they're living and staying in close quarters. So I think that's really interesting. Um, and we're seeing, we're seeing that you know, play out in, in, in other parts as well. So th these may be some of the things that, um, that we see you know, as we think about pivoting and we think about understanding those key issues. And we think also about how do we, how do we as destination marketers or how do we as hoteliers how can we think outside the box? How cool is it that the Fairmont was like, you know what, we'll put you all up in one wing of the hotel so we can keep, we can keep you all together. That's really innovative thinking. And I think that's what, the, what this specialization will help you to do is to think strategically about, okay, how can I mitigate the risk here? How do we safely communicate to visitors? And um, what, do I, what else do I need to be thinking about? So these skills are really, really valuable. Next slide, please. So, there's been some good with COVID. And I, and I think that, again, I think we're seeing such leadership in some of these areas. We're seeing really significant leadership with the BC um, Lodging and Campground Association. They've, including Tourism Vancouver Island, who've done just a great job of, about thinking, okay, how do we get all these people who would normally go south, they'd go to Arizona or they'd go to Florida, how do we get them here in BC? Because we have a milder climate in Southern BC. So how do we get them here? That's a great opportunity, thinking about how do we put heads and beds in, in, in our region. It's really interesting. Um, really significant increases in bike sales, in boat sales, in RVs, in houseboats, where people can go and be reasonably self-contained. And so we're seeing those increases in visitation and campgrounds, et cetera. I also, I'm digging into this a little bit, so I'm not prepared to fully, fully commit to this, but I, what I am seeing preliminarily is what I think might be some key learnings that have come out of the 2017 and 2018 fires in, the nor in Northern BC and in the Caribou Chicotin region, whereby they learned, unfortunately, by fire, literally, that the importance of um, making sure that the communication that was going out about exactly the regions that were affected was really important and helping visitors understand exactly where the risk was and what they were doing to mitigate that risk and where they could go and still be safe still travel safely. And that included in the backcountry. And what I'm seeing preliminarily is 
Well, urban centers like, for example, the Vancouver region or even uh, Vancouver Island are seeing significant reductions in visitors. I'm actually seeing the opposite in Northern BC and in the caribou Chicotan region. Um, caribou Chicotan region right now is up about 25%. Um, the September numbers are, are, it's a significant increase over last year. And, and so I think, you know, there may be a couple of factors at play there, but I, I think that they've also learned from their disaster experience and have been able to apply it. And so again, when you're working in those regions and when you have this skill set, your ability to be nimble and then apply what you've learned to subsequent disasters is really valuable. Okay, I think we've got one more. We're seeing a shift from what, I, what we would traditionally call a DMO or destination marketing organization to truly destination management. And what that means is the DMOs are taking a more active role. They're saying, you know, we still want people to come to our community. And that means that they're engaging with local government. They're engaging with emergency managers. They're engaging with, of course, their stakeholders. But they're also talking to residents and trying to get a sense of that resident perception. Um, Destination Canada has done some really interesting research about visitor, or sorry, resident sentiment. So trying to understand from residents, how do they feel about people traveling in their region? You won't be surprised to hear that Atlanta Canada's uh, numbers are pretty good relative to other parts of the country. And again, that's because of that bubble tourism and I think effective communication there. Um, but it's interesting to see that shift and that destination marketing organizations are recognizing that they have a role to play. They have a relationship with the visitor. They, uh, the visitor looks to them to help provide guidance because as I said, they don't see that geographic boundary. They don't see the dotted line between communities or regions like we do. And so the DMO has an opportunity to help people make good decisions, to provide effective, what I call effective risk communication. So sharing and being straightforward and transparent about what is and what is not open and how people can be safe, expectations of the community. Yes, you can come here, we're open for business. Please wear a mask, wash your hands, maintain physical distance. And these types of attractions are not open. So just being transparent about what is and what is not open is such an important piece. And I'm really seeing DMOs step up to the plate here. And I, again, I think that this is one of those skills and, and conversations. And, and Eugene, when I was in the program, we had a lot of conversations about the role of DMOs and in addition to hoteliers and that they're part of that, they're part of the system, they're part of that mix. They're also doing a lot of research and that's helping to make them, helping them make good decisions in terms of, in terms of the go forward and how to pivot, particularly out of a COVID, um, this COVID situation, but, but even outside of other disasters. Um, I think that's, I think I'm going to pause there. Um, one of the other things I'm seeing, and I'll just make one last question is, or one last comment is around those, what I call critical incident protocols. And I think that this is, again, one of the tools or one of the skills that you will learn and, and will learn to proactively start to consider. And that is, what are the things we need to do? What kind of emergency action plans um, have been integrate, have been built in the community and how is tourism positioned? So one of the things that I learned and was able to do was to take this knowledge and go back to my community partners and say, y'all, tourism is not considered here. At one time, tourism was not a factor, was not integrated into emergency plans. Visitors were not on the list. If, you, if they turned up at a, at a reception center, sometimes they were turned away. Um, and, and that is no longer the case. And what the, one of the other things we're starting to see is that the recognition that in some communities, and I think of resort communities in particular, where you may have a much smaller resident base, maybe 2,000 or 3,000 people, but you could have 20 or 30,000 visitors there at any one time on any given day. And so it isn't okay to say those individuals are not going to be looked after or we're not going to find a way if it, god forbid there had to be an evacuation that we're not going to to support them so they have to be integrated into plans and key stakeholders major hoteliers the destination marketing organization has to be included we have an opportunity to ensure that we're mitigating economic risk that we are communicating effectively and part of that means tourism has to be part of the conversation and we d that we have somebody with tourism knowledge who is the spokesperson. So you don't have a fire chief, with all due respect to the fire chief, that you don't have a fire chief standing up and saying, don't come here. That you have a chief who can stand up and say, you know what, we are having a wildfire in this part of the community, but it is still perfectly safe to come here and you can go here, here, and here. And and, the, and whatever the tourism organization is there can provide support. And so I, that helps to mitigate 
the risk associated with people mass cancellations, which is which is something we've seen in the past. Because you get somebody who's you know just wants people to be safe and doesn't realize that the power of the words. But I'm going to pause there and ask uh, for questions. I'm seeing a few things come up in the chat box here. Jen, I'm wondering, because um, there's been a few really good questions before we dive into those, I I'm wondering if you would be willing just to like share a little bit about, um, you know, your journey in the MATM, you did in uh, disaster and emergency management, you did it a specialization before there was even a specialization that existed. <laughs> I, I made my own specialization. <laughs> <laughs> Just so awesome. And, um, and then like the fact that you're in the, maybe talk about your doctoral research, what you're doing sure. right now, and also your work, because I, I just feel like, you know, you shared so much amazing information, and um, it would be great to, for people to contextualize what your journey has been so they can maybe see themselves sure. in it as well. Sure. So for me, um, so I came to uh, Royal Roads. I, I am originally from Ontario. I came west by way of the Yukon, and I came to Vancouver Island about 12 years ago. And I worked in hotels, DMOs, kind of a little bit of back and forth, but I was always, always, always interested in the disaster and emergency management side of things, and in particular around the communication aspect. And for me, that started with 9-11 and SARS followed, followed shortly thereafter, and I realized very quickly that we didn't collectively have a plan. And so when the opportunity came up to go to railroads and to do my master's, I, it was it, honest to God, I was there two weeks and I said, I'm going to do doctoral research. My husband told me I was crazy and I needed to do one degree at a time. But it was such a, truly, it was a life-changing experience. I, I learned so much and I have been able to take that knowledge back. So I did a lot of tourism consulting. Um, I also teach at Vancouver Island University. And of course, I teach risk management because it's like my favorite course. Um, and I teach lots of other things too, but, but that's one of my favorite courses. But I also try to weave in that conversation around how do we be mindful and aware of the hazards in, and, uh, that are in our communities? And what role does the DMO play? So my master's research was really centered around uh, Vancouver Island and, and trying to understand do emergency managers even, are they even connecting with the tourism entities? And if so, what is that conversation like? And, you know, is there two-way communication or is it simply just a sharing of information? And what I learned very largely was there was no communication. And so what I saw was a shift and was able to help some of my destination marketing organization colleagues say, you need to take a more active role here. We have an opportunity to be part of the conversation. Um, and in Tofino, uh, we made some, some really interesting strides there. And um, when the emergency operations center was activated, we were, we, were, we were completely connected. We built critical incident protocols for communication. So it was like, if this happens, then we do this. And it included our friends in Euclid and in Port Alberni. And so I'm, you know, I'm really proud of that work. And that sort of led me to, to my doctoral research, which is centered around wildfires and looking at the role of risk communication and um, visitor perception. How do, we, how do we communicate risk? What have we learned from wildfires? And can that be applied, um, can that be applied in, a, in a visitor setting? So I'm looking at both Australia and, uh, and British Columbia. I also work for Red Cross. So, um, I am, uh, so I, I live disasters every day, quite literally, and have uh, been part of the COVID-19 response. I uh, was there in Cornwall helping Canadians who were repatriating from uh, cruise ships in Japan and in other parts of the world, and, uh, and have responded also to wildfires. I went to Mozambique last year for Hurricane uh, Idai, which was a Category 5 cyclone that came through. So um, I have really hands on on the ground risk communication experience, but I always my love truly is tourism. Thank you so much. Such an incredible background. I love hearing you speak, Jen. <laughs> um, one of the questions that I thought was uh, a great one that because both of you can probably speak to this because I know this is a bit of a, a passion for you, Eugene, as well, is Fabian asked, is over tourism in a destination referred to as a disaster as well? So how would you define that? Eugene, you go, then I'll go. <laughs> um, I guess my views on over tourism is it's like anything else, it's a matter of perspective. Because um, well, first off, it depends on where you come from and what you're used to. 
it also depends on how far out you're talking about the over tourism. And I'll give you an example. Um, you go up to Banff prior to COVID, of course, and you go down the main street and it might be completely packed full of people. So you might feel that it's a bit of over tourism when you're on Banff Main Street, but you go one street off either direction or you go off into the back country a little bit and you don't see anybody. So, you know, somebody might say, sure, on Banff Avenue, there's over tourism, but outside of that, maybe not. Um, we also did research years ago with perception of crowding and depending upon your culture, um, you know, you might think that within people within five feet of you is crowding and others might think that's normal. So it's really uh, a, totally a matter of perspective with over tourism from my perspective. Can I just add something just because what about what about places where they're actually seeing environmental um, like negative impact because I remember you did a webinar on over tourism <laughs> Eugene and yes. you use the the beach from that movie the beach so yeah Kofifi would that and, be and interpreted yes and that's definitely that's when you've gone beyond with that uh, carrying capacity of a destination, whether it be social or environmental or even economic, um, where there are too many people for that destination, too many people for that area. Um, Venice was also, is also the same sort of situation or was prior to COVID, um, where the people, the actual locals are feeling like they're being pushed out of the situation. So definitely you could consider all of those as disasters, uh, especially if you are a local. Um, and this sort of you know, disaster and emergency management perspective and the learnings that you would do in that sort of situation would definitely help with um, not only development of the plan like communications plan, but even just the how do you deal with the people? You know, where do you draw the line? Where do you say enough is enough? Um, who makes the decisions? Who do you bring in to make those decisions? Because too often, um, not all of the players get to sit around the table and make that help make those decisions. So, and go ahead, Jeb. I agree. No, I was gonna say, I agree with that. Um, I, I think this is where that conversation around residents you know, versus visitors. And you actually hear that go away visitors, you know, in, in, we were seeing in Spain, we were seeing it in Venice, we're seeing it in Machu Picchu. Um, and, I, and I think that that is where the challenge is. And so part of that is, in my view, is a community engagement strategy. And I, you know, I'm such a believer in tourism does not operate in isolation. And I think our role as destination managers, and that's what I believe a DMO is, is a destination manager. And it means all the parts of it. It means being integrated and collaborating with our colleagues at the municipality, with our colleagues at the province, understanding how highways might impact, um, you know, a destination. Decisions that are being made at all parts, tourism has to be part of the conversation. And I think um, there are, these are some of these examples that we've highlighted here are examples of places where, the, where tourism has not been part of the conversation. The decisions have been made to go ahead and you know, have more taxi licenses or to allow more cruise ships because there's an economic impact associated with that. And some governments may be being measured by that. And so they're, you know, maybe a little bit uh, fearful of, of backing off. And so do we have another industry that can step in um, I think on the flip side, I'm going to just share some of the positives that I think are, are really amazing here in British Columbia. And, and I think BC, and from my perspective in Canada, is absolutely leading the way. And I would argue, you know, in, in more broadly than that even. Um, we're seeing a complete revamp of the Emergency Program Act here in British Columbia. And part of that means tourism is actually identified as a key sector. I like, I have to tell you, I was at that announcement and I may have done the happy dance when that announcement was like, when I saw the, the paperwork, I was thrilled. It is, it is, you know, we've been seeing from the rooftops, particularly as a result of 2017 and 2018 fires, that, that tourism is how many small communities get back on track. It's a key economic driver in their community. 
And finally, that's being recognized at the provincial level. That is huge. In addition to that, we have other things like the Sendai framework, and it speaks to you know, disaster risk reduction initiatives. And, and that's a lot of, you know, some of the work that we do from a Canadian Red Cross perspective is liaising with communities, the recognition that tourism is there. And again, that's where my skill set from a tourism perspective comes in, is that, you know, how do we mitigate some of those risks and what are some of the gaps that we need to start to fill in and, and consider? So I, I, you know, I don't know that I would qualify over tourism as a disaster. I think you could frame it. I think you could make the argument. That it is but again for me it comes back to the resident versus visitor perspective i think it also really highlights the importance of the research and being able to understand the research and to conduct the research because i think too often in the past some of these decisions are made without a full understanding or appreciation of what's actually going on mm -hmm. so when you've got that ability to do the research and understand it then I think better decisions can be made. Agreed. I also think that the loudest voice is not necessarily the right voice. And so we also have to look at who's not at the table to, to determine that we've, that we've captured that point of view, because that point of view may be the most important consideration. And sometimes I think about our Indigenous partners in, in that regard, because I think sometimes, you know, I think we're getting better at it but it's, it's certainly not perfect. And, and I think we have to make sure that we're considering that as well. Such great points. And, and again, I just like, you know, this, the strategy piece for, for tours and management and really like how now is just like the perfect time to, to step into more of that strategic minded way of being. And of course this really speaks to that. So that's so neat. Um, we are we are starting to get short on time, but the the question here that Victoria has posed is are and I think in reference to over tourism, are there places where they have limits and you have to reserve to see certain parks and land parks like like Everest? So I guess that speaks to you know what I was saying when I asked you know about the beach where there's this environmental impact that's happening. Um, again, like this is actually Victoria, a great strategic. Uh, way of looking at things is like how do how can we actually keep the draw here um, without um, damaging further damaging the the place itself I'm wondering if you guys have any any words well, on that. Machu Picchu did, has put limits on um, when and how people can visit we're seeing um, limits in terms of time of year when you can go to the Christmas islands uh, for snorkeling and and those water uh, experiences and that's off of the coast of Thailand. Um, you talked about the beaches, which is um, also in Thailand and there are other areas like uh, um, a couple of other sort of key dive spots in in Thailand, for example, that have been closed due to over tourism or um, you know degradation of the environment. And, you know, I think we're seeing, we're seeing limits also in, in Spain and we're seeing limits in Venice to some degree. Yep. Um, and even more local example is the West Coast Trail. And I see Tracy's put that up there because what they did was they set uh, a certain, to give the right visitor experience, uh, they set limits on the number of people that can start from either end of the trail um, on a daily basis because they recognized that if you were going to be out there, you were expecting a certain type of experience. So that's when they set um, those, those limits to that. I think Eugene, the other piece, and we've had a lot of conversation about this during the MATM program too, was around um, you know, destination reputation. And I, I think you just nailed it. When, when the visitor experience is compromised, our reputation as a destination is also compromised. So part of that is being really truthful and transparent about, about the experience that people can have here, even during a pandemic, even post a hurricane or post wildfire. We're seeing that right now in Australia. Here are the places that you can go that are safe because of course we know they had catastrophic bushfires at the beginning of this year. Um, we're seeing that in parts of the US. We're seeing that, in, we saw that in Canada following the wildfire. So, so, so that being really truthful and transparent about what people can expect, um, and, and I think the other layer here, and I'm just going to give one more um, example, post earthquakes in Christchurch, New Zealand, one of the key learnings that came out of that was considerations for airlift. So most people were traveling through Christchurch. Now you see those flights almost divided, not quite evenly, let's say, you know, 60, 40, where people are going into Wellington. And initially there were significant, um, 
there were there was part of the massive impact to tourism when the earthquakes happened was people couldn't get to other parts of New Zealand, even though the area that had been primarily impacted was Christchurch. So part of that communication and, and, and forwardness had to be let's figure out a way to get people to different parts of the of the country to explore and ensure those dollars are still coming or facilitate rerouting of itineraries. And we're mitigating that destination reputation impact because we're providing the service and, and the experience will be positive because it's outside of Christchurch, um, which had been impacted by earthquakes. Thank you so much. This is a great discussion. So many different angles to explore this from. Um, okay, I'm going to pull back up the PowerPoint and quickly go through the application process because we're just a few minutes out. Um, but I want to thank everyone for, for being here and thank you, Jen and Eugene. Great discussion. And um, I will bring the PowerPoint back up now. All right. So for those of you, I know there's a few people on the call who have already applied and are about to start, which is wonderful. Um, but for those of you who are still thinking about it, I'll just give you a quick overview of uh, some of the application requirements. So uh, for standard admission, we are looking for a four-year degree um, with a minimum GPA of a B from a recognized post-secondary institution. We'll also be looking for two years of full-time work experience within the uh, tourism and hospitality industry. But um, that can look like many different things. You know, don't write yourself off. Have a con conversation with Now or Tracy if you're not sure if your experience fits because more often than not, people have more experience than they actually give themselves credit for. Um, and just so, to note, if you don't meet the GPA requirement, uh, that doesn't mean that you won't be admitted into the program, but you may be required to take the academic writing and critical thinking course that's offered through our professional and continuing studies. And really what that's about is making sure that you're going to be successful in the program, uh, especially if you've been outside of academia for a number of years. Uh, you, we want to make sure that you're going to be able to to do well and um, that's that's really what that's about so we will look at you holistically which which i'll speak to in the next slide when i talk about flexible admissions so flexible admissions is actually for individuals who maybe don't have a full degree maybe you have a diploma uh, and you've worked for a number of years so in this case we would be looking for a norm, uh, at least seven years of work experience in a progressive leadership role um, but we will look at the the entirety of your experience so We'll look at work experience, volunteer experience, projects that you've led, anything that, that is relevant to what's brought you to this place where you're ready to do this degree. And if we think that, you know, you're in a place where you're going to be successful in the program, because that's really what we're about here at Royal Roads, we're wanting people to be successful, then you could be admitted under this admission. Um, it is case by case. And, and if you are considering coming in through flexible admissions, I would really encourage you to reach out to an enrollment advisor. They can really help guide that process and give you kind of a, uh, an idea of where you're at uh, in terms of maybe um, you're you know you have beyond what what you would need and you'd be a great candidate or maybe there's there's an area where you maybe need another year or so of experience and then you would be a stronger candidate so have the conversations the supports are there it's it's really worth to to invest in that and with once you're ready to apply there is a hundred and twenty six dollar and twenty eight cent fee um, once you pay that you can start submitting your documents so your official transcripts need to come to a sealed and then uh, your CV this is gonna be a multi-page document don't worry about all keeping it on one page it can be many pages uh, detailing all your work experience volunteer experience non-credential education specifically if you're coming through the flexible admissions this is gonna be a really important document and then your personal statement or, or letter of intent so there's some guiding questions on the website and this is is really about distilling the reasons why you want to do this program, um, what you're hoping to get out, out of it, and what you're hoping to bring into it. You know, I didn't go deeply into some of the tenets of Royal Roads, but we are really about co-learning and, and creating kind of this bigger body of knowledge together. So we also want to know what you're, you're going to be contributing to our learning community, so you'll be able to speak to that. I personally love this exercise. I've done it a few times. I'm a two-time grad from Royal Roads, so um, you know, it, it's just a really important way to really be clear. Um, something you can read if you're you're into the depths of research and wondering why you started it, you can come back to the letter to remember. Um, and then there's the two letters of reference. So uh, one professional and one academic is ideal, but if you've been outside of academia for a number of years, we will accept two professional letters. Um, you just want somebody who's gonna be able to speak obviously to your professional abilities and also to your ability to dig into research. That would be ideal. And they do need to come through a professional letterhead or a professional email. 
So for the next intakes, we have one coming up in April for on campus and the application deadline is currently February 19th. And then we also have a blended coming up uh, this September. So the blended model, uh, as, as discussed in the beginning, that's a online, uh, obviously everything's online right now, but it is predominantly online with residencies on campus. So if you're wanting to work or continue living where you're living, the blended is a really good option. Um, we do rolling admissions, so the sooner you get all your documents in, the sooner you can be adjudicated and find out if you've been accepted in the program, and that can really help with the planning. So do keep that in mind, even though the deadlines in some cases are, are fairly far out. You know, if you are planning to do it, it's going to be in your best interest to um, apply sooner rather than later. And of course, financial aid. I know this is a big question for, for many people, and um, maybe I can ask Tracy or now if you can put the website uh, into the chat box so that people can grab that. Unfortunately, we don't have live links anymore with my, my screen share, but um, you know, do get in touch with the financial aid. There's lots of bursaries available. Um, they can also give you an outline of your tuition schedule because sometimes when you're looking at the, you know, the full number of your tuition, it can be, um, you know, just wrapping your head around how that's actually going to look over the, the time that you're in your program can be really helpful for planning. And, you know, of course, finding out about bursaries and free money is good too. So definitely take advantage of that. Uh, and enrollment services. So as you can see now, and Tracy have been in the chat box and super happy to help you. Um, I really encourage you to reach out to them if you have any questions. They're really about supporting you through this process of creating your application and, and figuring out what program is going to be the best fit for you. So certainly reach out to them. Um, they'd love to hear from you. And with that, we are at the end of the presentation. I see there's been a number of um, things in the chat box. And, and of course, now I can't pull up my chat box again. Let's see if this works. Oh, okay. It's, is it mostly, mostly links? links. I um, missed any? Okay, great. Looks like one of the financial aids was maybe not the link, but it wasn't working, but I'm sure we can follow up on that. Yes, absolutely. Okay, wonderful. Well, that brings us to the end. And again, I want to thank everyone. And Thank you so much, Jen. We just like love having you on here. Um, yeah, you're such a such a passionate speaker about this topic. I'm always so engaged. I'm a I'm a huge Royal Roads fan, and you know I don't get paid to say this. <laughs> I just I, I think that the program has such tremendous value, and um, you know I'm truly a believer in it. And I the specialization just like makes me so excited. Um, and I would just maybe second your comment, Alana, around apply early because it for me that was really valuable. It allowed me to sort of plan my life. Um, and you know, in a pandemic, especially, that's probably really helpful. So I'd encourage folks to do that as well. But thank you for having me. Yes. Especially for the international students. Is it wrong to say it's fun to talk about disaster and emergency management? <laughs> um maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just, in, in, a, in a helpful way, I want to help people. That's really what this is about. I want to help industry be ready and I want to help people recover sooner and faster and have the skills they need to, to develop. So I think it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think so. There's one, there's one final question. First, uh, uh, to be in touch and for those of you who are watching the recording um, be in touch if you have any questions and we would be happy to support you okay goodbye for now thanks everyone <laughs>